Joseph could no longer control himself before, before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him. So no one stayed when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me here to preserve, before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in these lands two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep you alive for, for men, keep alive for you many survivors. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me a lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now... Your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. See, is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, in the young adult fiction series, Harry Potter, uh, there is this idea of a room of requirement. This is a clever plot device where you can essentially summon up anything you need whenever you need it. The idea of the room of requirement is in this magical castle where they are based, called Hogwarts, there is a room that will take the exact form of you of whatever you need it to be, as long as you walk by that specific, it's a blank spot in the wall, that specific blank spot in the wall three times thinking about a thing that you need. Now, the main characters of the book series learn how to master the room of requirement, so they know how exactly to make it work for them. They discover its secrets. But theoretically, for this castle has theoretically been there for a thousand years. And so for a thousand years before, people would just randomly come across the exact thing that they needed. They would be wandering the castle looking for a thing. One thing that gets used in the series is the idea of a place to hide something. I'm looking for a place to hide something. And there, all of a sudden, would be a room with exactly what you needed, a place to hide something. The uh, professor, the kind of headmaster of the school, Albus Dumbledore, says that he discovered the room when he was looking for a bedpan in the middle of the night. He is wandering the halls, the I don't know why, he was wandering the halls of the castle looking for a bedpan. And all of a sudden, he found an entire room that he had never seen before full of nothing but bedpans. Right? It is this idea that at random, you will find exactly what you are looking for. Again, from a source you never could have expected it, right? Up until that moment, you did not know there were, was a room full of bedpans, in part because up until that moment, there was not a room full of bedpans. That is the nature of the room of requirement. And so in a magical castle uh, controlled by an author... All coincidences are suspect. But also, in a universe controlled by a divine creator, all coincidences are suspect. This image of the room of requirement, of randomly stumbling across exactly what you need, exactly when you need it, from a source you never could have expected, 
is a reasonably uh, decent analogy for how God's providence, for how God providing for God's people plays out here in Genesis chapter 45. This is one of those stories where familiarity with it makes us lose sight of just how random it seems that the series of coincidences that have to line up for God's people to make it through this famine have to be. Because it goes back to the kind of genesis of this story is Joseph getting sold into slavery by his brothers. They're tired of him. They're tired of his favored son status. Um, They're tired of the fact that he will let them know that he is clearly the favored son. And so they arrange to have him sold into slavery and tell their father that he died, right? That's where we start. We start with 11 brothers rising up against one, doing violence to him and selling him far, far away. That's the beginning of the story. And we end with God's people being saved from famine as the end of the story. That's some distance. How could they know that selling their brother into slavery, which was a bad thing, God could use to save God's people? So right, Joseph is a slave, um, gets uh, purchased by a guy named Potiphar. Uh, He does very well in Potiphar's house. Uh, God blesses Potiphar because Joseph is his servant, but then Potiphar's wife uh, takes an interest, shall we say, uh, in Joseph. And uh, although Joseph does not sin, Joseph gets thrown in prison anyway. So he's gone from being a slave uh, to now being a prisoner um, in the Pharaoh's kind of supermax prison. And from the Pharaoh's supermax prison, because he also got locked up with the cupbearer of Pharaoh and the baker of Pharaoh, he now, it turns out, his talent for dream interpretation becomes respected by Pharaoh. And so because Pharaoh respects his dream interpretation abilities, Pharaoh helps, puts Joseph in a position to start leading the buildup to protect against this famine that Joseph has predicted. And therefore, he ends up as the lord of all of Egypt, right? Essentially like a president or a prime minister. Prime minister is probably right. Like there's a king, um, there's a Pharaoh, and then he's like the prime minister of Egypt, Again, he was a slave and then a prisoner, is now the prime minister of Egypt, and his family had two choices of which way to go to find grain. So at this point in history, the Holy Land, um, Israel, uh, they're not called Israel yet, it's the land of Canaan, um, is between two great empires, the Egyptians and the Assyrians. And they actually are literally the crossroads between these two empires. And so if you're going to go, if your land is enveloped in famine um, and your local government has failed you, you go to one of these two empires to get your bread. They could have gone to the Assyrians, but they chose to go to the Egyptians. Where it just so happened that their ex-slave, ex-prisoner turned prime minister brother is the one who runs the grain distribution for the nation. And then, the really important piece, Joseph's forgiven them. Joseph, even if the brothers don't, Joseph sees the bigger picture, understands that God is at work. So the brother that they attacked, sold into slavery, inflicted a life of incredible hardship, happened to rise above it, also forgives them their trespasses, and feeds them understanding that this is exactly how God intends to provide. Picking up with verse 6. For the famine has been in this land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and so to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. This is how God provided for God's people. This could not be predicted. This essentially feels at random. As random as wandering through a castle you think you know well in the middle of the night and all of a sudden stumbling across a room full of bedpans you were hitherto unaware existing, right? They could, they could have no way of knowing. They might know that their brother was in Egypt, right? Because there was the Midianites that sold him to the Ishmaelites and they might have seen him go, you know, whatever that is, south, west, rather than northeast, right? They might know that Joseph ended up in Egypt. Maybe. But they could not possibly know what happened to him from there, right? For all they know, he's already dead. They certainly don't know he became prime minister, right? This is essentially feels at random from the most unexpected place. They receive exactly what they need so that God's people can survive. Not only did Joseph survive slavery and imprisonment, not only did he end up a lord of all Egypt, not only did he receive a dream from God predicting the famine and make him able to prepare for it, but he also forgave them, understood God's role in this and God's hand in his life, and so they come to a man who you feel that, you, you know, I, I say in the Grow Pray Study, like you see them blanch, right? Like they, I am Joseph, your brother. Lots of uncensored thoughts, right? Oh no, we've doomed God's people. You can, I can, you know, I, I, I say this in the thick piece, but I, you can hear that internal monologue, right? Oh no. Oh no. We've killed, we've killed our family. We've killed them because we did that thing to Joseph, you know, 20 years ago. We don't, time is weird in the Old Testament. We have no idea. A long time ago. Long enough that, like, Joseph has grown up sufficiently that they don't recognize him on sight, right? He's also, he's an Egyptian high official, and so we don't think about this, but he's probably, like, heavily made up, right? So he probably has, like, the, like the black sweeping eyes. And so Joseph was probably, not, and he's speaking some version of Egyptian, um, and so, like, he's utterly unrecognizable, right? This thing we did long enough ago that we're here before this guy that we grew up with and we don't recognize him. Oh, no, we've just killed God's family. <laughs> we've killed our family. Uh, we've killed our mother. We've killed everybody uh, because the main source of grain in the world is controlled by the man that we definitely did wrong by. And unexpectedly, Joseph forgives them. Not unexpectedly for Joseph. Joseph's actually a really godly man. That's part of this story, is that Joseph is consistently godly, right? When tempted by Potiphar's wife, he, unlike other major biblical figures, says, no thank you, I'm not interested, uh, or runs away without his clothes so that he does not sin, right? When thrown in prison, he does not despair. He uh, instead lets God use him as a dream oracle, right? Like, uh, Joseph's a very faithful guy, and so this is actually really in character uh, with grown-up Joseph, but his brothers haven't known him since a teenager, and so they don't know that. We know that. They don't know that. It's dramatic irony. We know more than they do. We know that Joseph's going to forgive him. Even if you don't know this story, you can be pretty sure that Joseph is not going to look at his brothers and go, yeah, that sucks. I'm sorry. You're going to die now, right? We know, he, we know he's not. They don't know that. Because they would, I'm not sure they would do the same. They tried to kill him. God puts the pieces together that seemingly out of nowhere exactly what they need happens. God's people are saved. This is a matter of life and death, right? At this point, God's people is just that one family. And to save God's people is to save that one family. And the brother that they sold into slavery rose to the highest of highs in Egypt and forgave them and they ended up in his office. As the Blues Brothers say, and as I've said before in here, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And by the way, this process 
continues. As is often true, particularly of Genesis, this is not just the story of how God worked for one family. This is the story of how God works for God's people. It just so happens that for the bulk of Genesis, God's family, God's people is one family. But this is how God works in our world, too. I used to be a pastor in a town of 1,100 people, right? The entire town, this is true, I've done this math. The entire town of Lexington, Texas can fit um, into our unair conditioned sanctuary. Now, this week they all die of heat exhaustion, um, but we could fit the entire town of Lexington um, in the seating capacity of that room. We had just launched a contemporary service, and we did not have a worship leader. It was really clear that you know, the average age of that town was like 34. They needed something more to help that church take the next step. We launched a contemporary service, but we have this fundamental problem. Where do you find a worship leader in Lexington, Texas? Where do you find someone that knows the music and knows how to play the guitar and knows the, you know, worship leading is no joke. It is a specific talent. You cannot just find any musician and say, here you go, buddy, lead worship now. It is a very specific uh, skill set and spiritual discipline. How do you find a worship leader in Lexington, Texas? I did not have the answer to this question. I still don't know. Um, but uh, my uh, leaders of this service convinced me, Trey, let's just launch without the worship leader and let's find out what happens. And I'm like, okay, fine. We'll sing along to background tracks and it'll be okay. And it was okay. And then like the second time we did this service, this second week, there's this new family um, that shows up at random, right? We didn't know they were coming. Um, he was moving to town because uh, he was going to be a, a middle school vice principal um, in another couple towns over. Um, and so they were moving to Lexington, and they were checking out churches, and they checked us out. Cool, cool, cool. Lovely, very nice people. He pulls me aside at the end of the service. You know, we're doing the, you know, hi, no, nice to meet you, thank you for coming. But, you know, the, 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 the good, like, you know, we're so glad you're here pulls me aside and says, hey, um, so in a previous life, I was a worship leader um, at a mega church uh, in the Dallas area. Um, and uh, if you would like, um, I would love to help out uh, with the service in any way I can. And like my, my jaw hit the floor. Um, I had to, I had, actually I had to pull Joseph, right? Uh, the rhythm of this thing is Joseph has to keep excusing himself because he's so emotional. I had to excuse myself for a moment and like, you know, I almost hugged him and I just met him and that's probably a little more, you know, physical contact that he was really here for. Uh, but the worship leader that I had no idea how to get, I really still don't know how to get, he just showed up. He just showed up one Sunday and he became the worship leader and actually until that, you know, uh, that family moved away like Three, four years later, he was the worship leader for his whole time. He had lived in Lexington, Texas, and grew that service to the point where, like, finding a new worship leader was no longer as much of a problem. But, like, he just showed up at random. We had no idea he was coming. We have no idea how he found us. We have no idea how he found out about none of it. He just showed up at random. Most unex this is the most unexpected place where I was going to meet a uh, you know, former megachurch worship leader from Dallas is in Lexington, Texas, a town uh, where almost none of y'all know where it is um, because it's, 11, it's an 1,100-person spot on the map between uh, College Station and Austin. Similar thing happened to me when I was in a town of 20,000 people. Again, still a problem of how do you find a worship leader. My worship leader unexpectedly quits uh, the Sunday before Easter. Not ideal. Not a good time uh, to lose your worship leader uh, was uh, the Sunday before Easter. Uh, but there was a guy my age um, in the congregation um, who was a member of the church uh, because of some legal issues. Um, and that's how he ended up a part of our community, um, is for some complicated legal matters. He was now a member of Grace Church. And so I, 
Turns out, we didn't know this when we welcomed him in. We were just a church full of weird people, and we welcomed in weird people, and he was just another part of the weird and merry band. Um, and uh, we didn't know this at the time. He was a professional piano player um, and had, uh, uh, over a period of his life, taught himself to play the piano to an incredibly professional degree. And oh, by the way, we also about that time lucked into a baby grand piano for free in ways that I don't fully understand either. So all of a sudden, I have this professional piano player who is here who I did not know was a professional piano player and a professional level piano, and he became the worship leader, and as far as I know, still is. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Sometimes what you need shows up from the most unexpected places. And so if it's not clear to you how God is going to provide... That may be an uncomfortable place to be emotionally, but that doesn't mean that God won't provide. Certainly when the brothers show up, they don't know how God's going to provide. Certainly in that moment where the brothers find out it's Joseph, they do not know how God is going to provide. And then all of a sudden, God provides. We had no idea who Brian was. And then all of a sudden, here he is. He's leading worship, and he's, you know, from hundreds of miles away, and he found his way to Lexington, Texas, right? Just because you don't know, and it is not obvious to you how God is going to provide, does not mean that God isn't going to provide. It just means that we need to have better eyes to see. There's also an edge to this that we need to make sure we grab onto. You never know who's going to walk through your door. And you never know when they might be exactly what God needs us to have. You never know who's going to walk through your door. And you never know when they might be God's provision. The prime minister of all Egypt seemed like a pretty random person to be an instrument of God. And yet, for reasons we have just gone through, he was. You never know how God is going to open the right door, send the right person, provide the right thing, provide the right skill set, personality, whatever. You never know. It could be the random vice principal that's going to serve in Bastrop. It may be the dude with a strange legal thing that just ends up at your church who turns out to be a professional piano player. It may be the lord of all Egypt. You have no idea. That's just part of why churches need to cast a wide net. Because you never know how God is going to provide. You may end up with a person with all the money in the world and no skills and looking to have have that money be how they support the church. You may end up, as often has been true in my ministry, with the exact opposite. Someone who doesn't have a dime to their name but knows how to do things that no one else in the church knows how to do. My um, ex-rock and roller, ex-drug dealer turned amazing sound tech, Right? No one knew when that dude showed up that he had an incredible ear for how music needed to sound and could manipulate a soundboard to do it. Um, He looked up the heck a lot like an ex-druggie who, uh, you know, found his way to church wearing bear slippers and pajama pants. And who knew? But we really, because my old sound tech quit, and we really needed a new sound tech, and there was the sound tech we needed. You never know. It can come from the most unexpected places. And so part of being a person of faith is having eyes for the unexpected, to expect the unexpected, that the nice family that shows up turns out to be a worship leader, that the man in bear slippers that you you know, our surprise is here, but lovely to see you, turns out to have an amazing talent for audio. That the Lord of whole Egypt is actually your brother who you sold into slavery, and he's forgiven you, and he's going to leverage the power of this mighty nation to save you and all of God's people because he can see the bigger picture even if you cannot. Divine provision can come from the most unexpected places, such that maybe we should start expecting it. Expect the unexpected. Welcome all who come through our doors, because you never know when exactly what we need 
walks through those doors as part of God's great provision. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you provide. We give you thanks that you can see a degree of big picture that our tiny brains can never comprehend. That you move in absolutely mysterious ways, lining up pieces that we never could see, so that your will may be done, so that your people may be cared for, so the things you need to happen click into place. May we then have eyes like yours, eyes for the unexpected, eyes that can see hope in the Lord of all Egypt, and then the other random people you send in our way. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.